Welcome to TFR Newsroom. I am your host, Sopil Bharatiya, and my next guest is Kumar Gala, Principal Technical Lead at Linaro. Kumar, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Today, we're going to talk about 2.6 release of Zephyr. Uh, can you talk, tell me a bit about what are the new features of this release? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So I was the uh, release manager for the 2.6 release. Um, and the release was mostly focused on trying to stabilize a number of kind of subsystems and functionality as we get ready for the 2.7 release, will be, which will be our next long-term stable release. And so as part of that, kind of some of the new features that were, were added or, or looked at were, you know, some updates and overhauls to some systems. So we updated the, the logging subsystem was overhauled as part of this release to fix a number of uh, issues that kind of had been longstanding and supporting some features and, and, and so forth. So that was a big change. Um, we continue to focus on power management uh, in this release um, and then added uh uh, support for one of the new ARM uh, Cortex-M variants. So there's now uh, the Cortex-M55 core. So some initial support for that platform uh, was added. Um, and then I think, you know, the, there's a number of things and so forth. And then there was some additional work done around tracing in, in addition to the logging subsystem in this release. You mentioned traces logging. Um, if you look at uh, open source projects, like IoT or embedded like the Zipper, uh, this is it, it becomes a very uh, tricky space so from a security perspective can you first of all talk talk a bit about you know uh, what kind of challenges are there for zephyr because when i look at security there are two things either software bugs or misconfiguration or people just never updated it to the latest version which actually means there are bugs so can you talk about what are your concerns when you think about security from Zephyr's perspective. Absolutely, yeah. So there's a number of things that the project does for security. There's a specific security working group uh, and they're continually looking at the processes and, and what we're doing as a project. Um, and But there's a number of areas that we focus on. So there's everything from, you know, in the news lately, there's been a lot of talk on uh, software bill of materials. So we're, we're always, uh, um, utilizing the SPDX format and, and the code base. Uh, there was work added in in this release uh, around one of the packaging and, and manifest tools that is focused around how we, how we uh, bring Zephyr together. And, and so Zephyr, in addition to just the code base itself, is pulling modules in for various additional repositories, um, everything from like vendor HALs to uh, embed TLS, so libraries, these kind of things. And so we're always looking at making sure we're updating those packages um, as part of the release process to pull in security fixes and, and, and things of that nature. Um, and then in addition to that, there's activity going on on things around like trusted firmware. So we, we continually, we've been integrating on, on the ARM platform uh, for a number of releases. In this release, we, we added uh, as part of this one, uh, support for the 1.3 release of the trusted firmware project. So that provides a secure uh, trust environment that, you know, you can do uh, cryptographic, you know, uh, management or other things in a secure domain. These are the things that are kind of meant for those who really, it's not just nobody wants to take security seriously, everybody does take it, but for those who are willing to go extra mile to ensure security. But the, in most cases, people just rely, uh, kind of stay on the defaults. They don't want to do the extra work. So how do we also make it, make sure that even if a user, whether a user, I don't mean end user, but you know, whichever the vendor is, even if they don't want to go that extra mile, their their you know their products are still secure and safe. Yeah, so we we try to do a couple different things. So one is obviously easing the integration with these things, so making it much simpler. So the out of box experience has you know both the the configurations are, are set in such a way that either. Um, it's very clear and obvious that, you know, you know, like one of the common things that you always hear in the security practices is, is you know, changing passwords, default passwords, default keys, um, that, that these type of problems show up over and over again where a vendor builds a product and doesn't actually change uh, the defaults or, or so forth of, of what they're getting. And so we try to make sure that it's either very obvious or that things won't, you know, function in a particular way or so forth so that it kind of forces uh, the, the sort of product developer who's using Zephyr to make those changes. Um, and then in addition, you know, the, again, the kind of, as I mentioned a second ago about TFM and, and that 
the idea with some of the integration with that project is to kind of uh, make it easier for the vendors that are building these products again to to not have to figure out as much and figure out you know to be as as detailed of an expert in these technologies you know what um, you know cryptographic you know technology should I be using you know what type of hashes should I be using should I be using uh, TLS for my connections to the cloud and how should that work so there's a lot of questions that if you start digging into this and, and, and so forth, that you've got to go figure out an answer as, as a product developer, um, that a lot of these trying to, you know, take people that are experts in these fields that have, are, you know, well thought about these type of problems and threat models and all this type of stuff to, to sort of give, uh, you know, pre-canned configurations and solutions to people to make it easier. And that's kind of one of the benefits of Zephyr being, having that integration with a number of, of projects and and technologies together as opposed to kind of having um, what you may see in some other RTOSs where you kind of have to create all of that yourself and, and bring all of that together yourself. Since we are talking about security, uh, I would also like to talk a bit about the, the executive order by the Biden administration. Uh, I kind of wondered that, you know, why it took so long for us to do something like this. Uh, we should have uh, done it earlier because it, more and more we are using open source or we are becoming dependent on software. We should know what is in there. So if I ask you, how do you perceive this executive order, especially with the mention of as bombs and open source there? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, you know, it it's a, should be a natural thing that people know what's going into their software and packaging. And I think it's kind of one of the, you know, there's a couple different aspects to this. One is the benefit of open source is that you, you know uh, exactly, you know, you have the sources to what you're building your product around. And so if there is an issue, you're able to potentially get that, you know, whether you have the expertise yourself or not, but you're not encumbered by having a black box that maybe a vendor doesn't exist or, or so forth. And then you're left, uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do. Um, and, and we see this from very large companies. I know Google is a good example of this, where, where they've pushed and are continuing to push their vendors to have more and more uh, components in the system be open source based because to be able to sort of deal with that security and life cycle issues. And in addition to that, kind of this whole S-bomb, you know, space and, and so forth, I think is, is natural um, to be able to make it easier to know, you know, what, what's going on, um, you know, what components of, are you getting in as part of, uh, you know, your, your, you know, software that you're utilizing. Um, and as I kind of mentioned in Zephyr, we, we've been using, you know, and I know the Linux Foundation has kind of recently made some announcements on um, SPDX and the use of SPDX for S-bombs. Um, you know, we've been using SPDX uh, in Zephyr for a number of years now and, and ensuring it not just from, uh, you know, the security aspects that we're talking about and knowing what's going on, getting the latest, you know, updates to libraries and, and, and com the components that you're, you know, con you know pulling together as part of uh, your software package. But then there's also things like licensing and knowing the licenses of all these packages and make, ensuring that those are conformant to whatever you need for your company and that you're conforming to those licenses. So that tool and the capabilities there help with that as well. One thing that I want to ask you is that uh, what I hear a lot when I talk to a lot of companies is edge computing is really becoming very, very popular. But now Ziffer's case is kind of different. Right? You, you folks do very tiny. But uh, as this proliferation of edge devices, uh, and I don't necessarily mean those tiny, you know, is Ziffer or can Ziffer play any role in edge data center kind of use cases or that is totally out of your scope? No, I don't think it is. I mean, so one of the things that we're seeing and, and obviously the, the majority of focus has been in that kind of MCU space. So a sensor type of device, uh, you know, something that's uh, that's connected. And when people usually talk edge, they kind of mean, you know, something that's maybe like a gateway type of device for those, you know, sensors or, you know, an actuator, a motor or something that's that's kind of that's the actual MCU microcontroller. But one of the things that we've seen in the last couple of releases, and even in this release, one of the new features that was added um, was support for the ARC64 architecture, 
Um, we've seen a continuation of support for the ARM64 architecture in this release as well. And so you see that people are looking at using Zephyr not just kind of in the traditional microcontroller space, but in these type of spaces where um, there may be some type of, of processing that you're doing on a device um, that's maybe a gateway type of device, or maybe you're, you're, you're uh, doing something that's maybe on, on that edge side that's doing some security application or, or and you're worried about safety is another place where we're, we're starting to see this where kind of on these type of devices that may be in the edge um, or maybe a little bit larger than, than what you would traditionally think of for an RTOS or a Zephyr, you know, for use that we're seeing people looking at using that the Zephyr in those applications. Um, and so we see things like edge gateways and so things that maybe are running thread. Um, you know, I know that there's been some work that's being looked at around Matter being an open IoT home standard um, and support for that. So that, that, you know, these type of things are becoming more and more interesting. Um, and then, you know, things where you start seeing heterogeneous compute, so systems that may be on the edge where, you know, Zephyr may be... Uh, you know, playing a role where it's it's acting as the the software and firmware that's running the radio uh, devices for some of these applications. So maybe you've got a gateway, um, and it needs a Bluetooth connection, and that Bluetooth firmware may be on that radio for running Bluetooth. Maybe actually Zephyr uh, in that case. And so there's a, a wide breadth there potential for for where Zephyr could play in, in a number of spaces there. We have talked mostly about the software and technical side of it. I also want to uh, ask a bit about the community ecosystem side of it. Can you talk a bit about how you have seen the Zephyr community grow over the year? Uh, what kind of contributions you're seeing from where you're seeing them? You no, know, absolutely. So I've, I've been involved in Zephyr and I'd have to go back and see how many years it's been, but it's been a number of years now um, from some of the early 1.x releases that we did. And so it's, it's been great to see the community um, uh, grow uh, in in that time, and we've seen you know engagement from a large uh, breadth of people. So we have everything from we've had new platinum level members like Google and Facebook join in the pre in the recent years, and so you've got you know silicon vendors like Intel and NXP. Um, you have you know ecosystem vendors, Ant Micro, and others. Um, and so forth. So you have a lot of commercial companies that have an engagement in Zephyr. And so that's always good to have, you know, backing of, of those type of entities to make sure the project's continuing and, and, and you get the funding. But then there's a lot of, you know, whether it's contribution from community uh, individuals. So it may be that someone's working on a, a product that they're developing themselves um, and they're contributing back support. Um, so we've seen, you know, whether it's uh, product makers or or so forth. So there's a, a wide breadth. And I think we just recently had our thousandth contributor to the community. Um, and so we're seeing it grow, not just in the sense of the breadth of, of who's contributing, but where people are contributing from as well. So we're seeing a lot more uptick, I think, in the more recent years in, in contributions from Asia, um, where, you know, before I think, and there's still a significant contribution from North America and Europe, um, you know, companies like Nordic is another uh, platinum member, um, and Lenaro uh, that I represent being a silver member. So there's a lot, a breadth of, of, of contributions uh, going on. And, and I know we're continuing to try to engage uh, more and more outreach in the project and thinking about how do we get students involved uh, and, and, you know, more and more contribution and, and things of that nature. And I think there's some activities coming online that will hopefully, you know, even increase uh, the contributions more and more. But, you know, I think when you look at the project and how it's grown over the years, just you continue to see uh, just a, a, a continual uptick and increase in contribution and interest, uh, which I think is it shows the health um, and viability of, of the project and the interest that people have in having a, a, a very uh, open source, open governance, uh, you know, a, a project where they know if they contribute effort and time that their contributions are going to be valued and, and can be taken in. Um, and I think there's a lot of value that people see of that type of community. Kumar, thank you so much for taking time out today and, and talk about not only uh, the latest release of Zephyr, but also we talked about uh, something that is like, as I said, excited about uh, Edge use case uh, and and also a software bill of materials and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. 